Okay. Um, what, what we were up to? We've had a few we, conversations. We just talked and about uh, spirit interactions and love. But there was a lady who asked a question in the break. Would you like to ask your question? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Would you like to ask that question again, if you can remember? It's up the back there. Um, where's the other microphone? It's with Igor as well. Oh, it's with Igor. Okay. Okay, my, the question I asked was that um, if, if uh, any of us desired not to, to, move, to stay in on this level after the earth changes and, stay to, on the earth, yep. and to, to move into the spirit world, would we be separated from the, the souls that we love so much on this level? If as a family we all moved on to the other side... So if everybody in the family passed over... Would we be kept together? Yeah. A good was question, my, huh? That was my question. Yeah, good question. So the answer to that question revolves around the soul and the condition of the soul. So if you could think of here you are, a person on the, you know, on the earth. And, of course, you might have family and friends surrounding you, but in, individually you are one half of a soul, right? So there's your half of the soul. When you pass... Where you go in the spirit world is completely dependent upon the condition of this soul. So we, myself and Mary call that our soul condition. But our, we need to understand what our soul condition is to understand what's involved with the condition. Now our soul condition involves lots of various factors. It involves, one of the factors is our belief systems. So in other words, if we have a belief that when you die, you're dead, and then you die, and then you're not dead, obviously that's going to be pretty hard to come to terms with emotionally, right? If on one hand you had a belief system that you wouldn't be exist anymore, and then you, after you've passed, you still are existing, you might even imagine that you're still on earth in that state. So a belief system can definitely uh, cause you to make different choices if a belief system is based in error in particular, it can cause you to make all sorts of different choices. Now, each member of the family might have a different belief system. So one of them might believe there is life after death, one might believe there is no life after death, another one might believe that uh, when you die you go to heaven and you're with Jesus, and then another one might die, say that if you die and you've been bad, you go to hell. And then it, there's all these different belief systems. And... Each family member may, in fact, have a different belief system. Yes? So how will that affect them when they pass? So if, how that affect them when they pass is that when each family member passes, their choices and decisions are going to be guided by their belief systems. Can you see that? Just like your choices and decisions now on earth are, um, are often guided by your own belief systems. And this is... Uh, so just that one thing of having different beliefs, of family members having different beliefs is going to determine where you decide you, you know, can cope with emotionally living in the spirit world, for example. Just, just a set of belief systems will determine that. So you will also, because of belief systems, will be very attracted to other people with the same belief systems, right? just like we are here on Earth. So on Earth, if, uh, if you're a Greek Orthodox person, there's a pretty good chance that every Saturday or Sunday, every Sunday probably here, isn't it, you would actually meet with other Greek Orthodox people, wouldn't you? Because you all have the same belief systems, right? It's the same applies in the spirit world. If you have the same belief system as other people, there's a very good chance that you'll meet together with them and talk about your belief systems. Many of the belief systems don't change just because you've passed into the spirit world. Then there's another thing that it determines the soul condition called morals. Morals are the things like what do you feel about things ethically and also with regard to all forms of areas of life. So in regard to ethically, what are your ethics when it comes to sexuality? What are your ethics or beliefs when it comes to lying or stealing or cheating or... What are your ethics or your beliefs or your morals with regard to you know, what you eat and what you drink and what you wear? When I, say, when I say that to people, they say, what do you mean morals about what we wear? Well, well, for example, how many of you are okay with wearing a great big diamond ring on your finger when, when you know that to get that diamond ring on your finger, some people may have died to get that ring on your finger? 
right? How do you feel about that? What, what are your feelings about that? They are your morals, the, the belief systems you have about morality. Then there's your condition in love, which is a primary d dictator of your soul condition. So, in other words, how much love do you show to other people? Now, how much love do you feel? How much do you... You've got to feel love, remember. It's not, it's not what you do. It's what you're feeling for them. That is the key part there. So if you feel very little love for anybody, or you feel very little love for any male, let's say. The females, you're okay, you feel love for them. But the males, no, males are all just... You know, they're all just dogs. That's the way you feel. In, the, in Australian term, we call them mongrels, right? They're all just mongrels. So, so let's say you feel that about men. Well, then it's very unlikely that you have much love in yourself about, towards men, right? And therefore, it's very unlikely you're going to attract in the spirit world a location where there's lots of men. Can you see that? You're probably going to be attracting a location in the spirit world where there's more women than men, for example. Or you'll attract a location where there's just mongrels <laughs> or men who are not very nice, shall we say. Also, your susceptibility to further truth is a part of your soul condition. In other words, do you have an open mind? Are you easily taught new things? Or do you very resistive to new things? You know, you just don't like learning anything new at all. Well, obviously, if you like learning new things, then, then there's going to be people in the spirit world who will be able to teach you new things. And if you don't like learning new things, then and, and one, let's say one family member likes learning new things and another family member doesn't like learning new things. Well, obviously, the one who doesn't like learning new things is not going to enjoy somebody taking them by the hand and showing them new things they don't want to hear about. Whereas the, whereas the member of the family who likes to hear new things... That's what they're going to want to happen. They want to have somebody grab them and show them this and show them that. And when we <coughs> enter the spirit world, babe, it's a bit different to here, isn't it? Because our, in, our soul condition immediately dictates our location. And it immediately dictates um, what happens in our choices as well. So, yeah. so can you see there might be... There's now choices that we'll be making... Now give an example of a choice that's based on a soul condition choice. A person who's lived a long life on earth and they've been married three times and now they're divorced and now they live alone, right, is perhaps on earth not going to be very attracted to having another relationship, you know, where they're sort of married, right? But a young person who's like 15, 16, 20 years of age and hasn't had a long, any long-term relationships, let's say, they're probably going to want to have a relationship. Now, if that's the case, then each one of those family members will make a different choice about who they're going to live with, wouldn't they? Wouldn't that make sense? One of them would probably say, oh, I'm happy living by myself, and the other one would go, well, no, I'm not happy living by myself. I want to live with somebody. You know, I, want to, I want to have a relationship of some kind. The reality is, in the spirit world, you can still have relationships like you have here on earth, and so they might make different choices about the relationships that they have. We also have, oh, this one of the primary dictators of uh, soul condition is the amount of fear we have in our soul. And what we normally find with fear is the older we get, the more afraid we become. Have you noticed that? That, that is often the case. The older we get, you see, we've had more experience in life where life's hit us with hard knocks, where, where we've had difficulties. And mm -hmm. so what we finish up doing is our fear grows and we don't let that go and so our fear grows and we don't let that go and our fear grows and don't let that go and our fear and before you know it by the time you pass you've got fear up to here or up to here right inside of you now your your 15 year old son is not going to have anywhere near as much fear as that right but your 15 year old son might be feel, might might feel like he needs dad or mum to boss him around still and so he might stay with you for a time until he realises, no, hang on a sec, I'm tired of mum and dad bossing me around. I want to now go out and explore this new universe, this spiritual universe. And so he has less fear in doing so. And mum and dad might want to keep him home for a while, but in the end that won't work. And eventually he'll go off and start investigating other things. Right? 
And isn't it true that often in or in most families there are codependent addictions? So, for example, dad might be someone who um, who thinks pleasing mum is the way to find peace on earth. <laughs> <laughs> and and mum might feel like, yeah, men are good as long as they please men. If they don't, they're mongrels. So, yeah. so um, you can see that we don't actually have the same morals or beliefs about things, but we live harmoniously here on earth because we're meeting each other's Because we're sympathetic to each other's needs. Now, when we enter the spirit world, there's a, there is a sympathetic law of attraction that exists there as well. However, if I've lived for a long time, 50 or 60 years, in a particularly damaged... If I've had the most, the most attacking or damaging or angry emotion towards, the, towards another person, I can, find, I can pass and find myself in quite a, a dark condition compared to the person I've been attacking. Now, now can we define dark? Dark yeah. is... Not a good condition of love. Of love. In, other words, in other words, if I'm the being the person who's the attacker in a relationship all the time, the angry person in the relationship all the time, the person who manipulates the other person all the time, then I am in a darker condition than the person I'm manipulating or controlling. The less loving condition. I'm in a less loving condition, in other words. And the less, the less loving condition automatically means a lower place in the spirit world, automatically. You can't go to higher places in the spirit world if you're less loving. And now, if I've been raised as in a Catholic faith, and I might have let go of that once I left home, but I, as an early child, I was a Catholic or a... Um, what is it? Greek here? Orthodox. Greek Orthodox. Um, and I believe that when you pass, you either go to heaven or hell. And I pass, and I don't have a good condition of love in my soul, and I find myself in a place of darkness. Now, if I... I have still got the belief that, oh, that's it, I passed, I must be in hell. I'm not going to seek more truth because I believe I can't. choices because I believe I can't. So there I am. Until someone gets through to me and says, usually it's someone on earth, and says, it's okay, you can make a different choice. Just feel some fear <laughs> and About, change them. And, and feel that your beliefs are wrong rather yep. than that they're true. <laughs> and then you can grow in love. Right, so can you see already, before we get you to ask again, can you see already there's so many factors determining where this person is going to arrive in the spirit world and what they're going to do once they arrive there? Can you see that? And so for that person, and remember in a family there might be five, six, ten different people, so therefore five or six or ten different morals, different beliefs, different attitudes towards love, different attitudes towards truth and so forth. And all of those factors are going to influence where they all decide they want to be in the spirit world. But remember the other thing we said was about love. If, there, if love exists in a pure fashion in the relationship... Between the two of us or, the or between of the, the members of the family... Then there is always going to be an openness and an ability to communicate... And connect with and each And connect other. to each other. We just might be that we're making different choices and following different passions. We're not perhaps the nuclear family we were on earth. But if there's love in that relationship, then there's always the openness to connect. Now, if I'm, if I'm in the spirit world, I can travel from this location where I am right now to another location like Australia, if you can think of it that way, instantly. So it doesn't really matter that the two of us live thousands or hundreds of thousands of kilometres away from each other in the spirit world because it's just a matter of feeling about going there and we're there. And so we can easily close the gap or physical distance between us if we want to see each other at any time. So that there's no limitations of physical distance as to whether we see it. It's all to do with the soul condition that creates the limitation. So if my soul condition is in a poor condition of love, I might not be able to go as far in terms, of, in terms of my travel as if my soul is in a really good condition of love. Then I can traverse dimensional spaces in the spirit world. And because of that, my condition of love is going to dictate who I can spend time with and who I can see and what their condition is going to be as well. And I can't, if my soul condition of love is quite poor, I can't go into a higher condition than I currently am. I have to work my way through the soul-based reasons why my love is poor. Because of that, that means that if I've got a family member who's in a higher condition, living in a different location, I am dependent on them having a desire to see me 
because no matter how much of a desire I have to see them, I'm not going to get to their condition. I can't, I can't manufacture their condition uh, without doing some emotional work, some work on love. And so there are so many factors determining whether a family in the spirit world is going to stay together. Can you see that? Just lots and lots of different factors. Um, you, you, you talk, when you're talking about love, you're talking about love between humans. <coughs> yes, what which about, is the same in the spirit world. Yeah, but what about, what about love if you, if you have a tremendous love towards other creatures, not yes. just humans? Yeah. And, for example, um, I, I have a difficulty with people because... Ah, uh, yes, good question. <coughs> because I'm vegan. Yeah. And because I'm vegan, I, I, I see meat eaters or, or people who consume animal products yeah. um, ignoring the cruelty that is committed towards animals. And I, I find agree. it very difficult for me to see them as fellow souls. See, my, myself and Mary are vegan as, uh, vegan as well. So I, we understand where you're coming from. However, if, if you can't love a human, then that's going to greatly depend upon the condition of love that's really in your soul. Like, so, so one thing is, it's one thing to love animals and be, be vegan because you love animals. Quite another than to love a human who can bite you back and treat you as their enemy. And in the first century I said, we need to learn to love our enemies if we really want to learn and practice love on the planet and in the spirit world. So... When I'm talking of love, I'm talking more of a love that is able to love even those who do harmful actions towards animals. Love even those who do harmful actions towards other people. We must learn, if we're in a really good condition of love, we will be able to love every single person and thing. Not just the animals, but also the humans who do the damage. We'll be able to actually love them as well. It doesn't mean we agree with them, but we... It, Remember before the break, I was talking about the power of love to change someone. Actually, if a person is a person who is harming animals, and I know in Greece there's a lot of um, even uh, last time I was here, uh, someone was telling me about how the municipality put out um, pieces of meat with shards of glass in them to kill the to kill the dogs because there was too many stray dogs, which is very affecting for me. Like. I felt that really strongly at the time. But um, if I can't see that the person who puts down the meat with the glass in it has an injury around love, there's a wound within them that they cannot feel that that is not a loving act. Because you and I can feel that, wow, that's not a loving act. So the person who's doing it can't, is detuning from that sense within themselves. So if I can't have compassion and love that person, then I'm just adding to their wound. And their, their hopes for changing uh, re actually reduce. Even if I go and give them a lecture about how unloving it is. We can give them an angry lecture. <laughs> and, and I actually reduce the odds of them changing because love is the thing that would open a soul the most powerfully to change. Yeah. So that's why we talk about love of everyone being so important and a determiner of your soul condition in the spirit world. So if we're finding it difficult to love people because people can bite back and people can be nasty and people can be angry and people can be rageful and people can murder and be rape and steal and cruel. Yep. all those different things, then we still need to work through our emotions about why we can't love them. And Because a person in a really good condition of love will be able to even love a person who's damaging like that. They'll be able to have a feeling of love towards them. Now, that doesn't mean, as Mary said, that you agree with their actions. It just means that you love them and you don't have judgment about their actions in the sense you don't personally judge them as bad. You can see they're doing evil things, but you realise that all evil is the result of denial of emotions within each individual. Is the result, that's the reason why evil exists. We deny rage within us, we then express that rage externally as a result. And, and so if we can learn to love, then that's going to be the greatest determining factor of where we arrive in the spirit world and what we can do in the spirit world if we learn to love. And in particular, love humans, not just animals. Right? So it's a very, very important determining factor. Yeah. And as I was saying earlier, that requires... A 
deep amount of humility, you know, because it hurts. It hurts to feel what is being unloving that is that's being delivered to us. And the, but the only reason that we want to fight back against that is because we don't want to feel that feeling. When we feel that feeling and we desire to love, then we grow the capacity to love that person. And also it no longer hurts. So in other words, a person could be angry with us and it won't hurt us anymore. A person can be yelling at us and it won't hurt us anymore. A person could even beat us up and it wouldn't hurt us actually anymore. Because we've released the, the pain that it's triggering. Yeah. Yep. So, so the soul condition is very... So the individual soul condition in summary... And remember, you've got a family here, so every, every member of the family will have a different soul condition and different beliefs and different morals and so forth. Now, with a family, though, because they've been a family, there is a high likelihood that the different members of the family have very, very similar beliefs and have very, very similar morals and have very similar condition in love and they have a very similar desire for truth. And they make very similar choices and they have very similar amounts of fears. For that reason, many families, when they pass over into the spirit world, will probably pass into the same locations. And many family members greet those members of their family that have passed for yeah. a similar reason. Yeah. Does that make sense what, as to what happens there? So there's a whole lot of determining factors of what happens when you pass over. But you can see that a family generally does have many similar things with regard to everything that makes up the soul condition. And it's the soul condition that determines the location in the spirit world. Yep. Is there any more questions about that for yourself? No, no worries. If we can. Uh, yep, and Nicole had a question. If we come across to Nicole too, uh, if there's a mic somewhere around there. Yeah, from Nicole. Yeah, maybe it has been answered. Hey, but hey, oh, sorry. Oh. Start over here first. Oh. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Hi, AJ and Mary. How are you doing? Hello. Um, I'm just going to cut straight to the chase. Sure, cut straight to the chase. Um, recently, in the last couple of years, but in my whole life as general, I have very intense dreams. Yep. And they don't feel like dreams. Lots of things happening. <laughs> um, when you say dreams, they happen when you're awake? No, they no. happen when I'm asleep. When you're asleep yep. But it feels more like a lucid dream. Right. Yep. And they are epic in proportions. So you have very detailed yes. and memories. Long and long. Yeah. Yeah. Eventful. Yep. And um, they're of classic light versus evil showdowns, archetypal showdowns. Um, and I was just speaking to Mike just a moment ago, and he yep. said, mention your childhood. And I was like, okay, fine. I used to dream that I was the Roman soldier that put nails through your feet. So Cornelius. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I've actually got a hole in my foot <laughs> yep. Yep. today yep. on the foot that I pierced. It was always the left foot. Yep. And a couple of days ago... Um, a blister when infected, and now it's a great big wound. Right. So I just really want to know what's happening in the dream world yep. because um, it's, not, it's not darkness. It's really the darkest of all darkness. Yep. It really feels like demonic forces, and I'm exercising. So like what you'd see in the omen and, and yep. the exorcist. Yep. And, uh, yeah, I'm just coming and, clean, and really. in those dreams, are you, so this is different from now from the Roman soldier. Yes. Yeah. yes. In those, in the good, evil dreams, yep. are you yourself? Yes. You, you feel like I'm, what's your name, sorry? Anaya. Anaya, Anaya. that's yeah. right. I've met, yeah. yeah. Um, so you feel like I'm Anaya and I'm here. And your, um, I might be like an angelic version. Oh, an angelic version of Anaya. <laughs> Sometimes there's like wings and yeah. I've got a sword. Okay. Yeah, and I'm yeah. doing all of this. So it's kind very of myth mythological yes. uh, imagery. Yeah. Yes, yes. Good but night. you're on the force for good. Yes. yes. Right. You're yeah. never on the evil side? Oh, when I was younger, I went to that place. Okay. Yeah, good. I wanted yeah. to fight so badly yeah. that I realised, oh my God, I've become it. Right. Yeah. Good eye. Okay, well, that's a good question, Anaya. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's discuss what's happening for you. Okay. Um, so here's Anaya. Sorry about the dress, Anaya. It's like 
So here's you, half of the soul, of course. Now, um, every single thing that happens to us is due to a whole series of events, usually, that are a mixture of different things. There's firstly what you would classify as your personality. Now, some of your personality God has actually created. In other words, every single person is individual in nature and your half of the soul is very individual. No other person in the universe has the same half of the soul as you, uh, as you are. Right? So that is God's creation of your personality. But the other half of your personality is to do with events that happen through your life that you then absorb as a part of your personality as well. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So a lot of your personality is, you would classify it as soul-based, God-created, and then some of our personality is what the surroundings have created. We also have characteristics. Each individual has specific characteristics and different... Um, different things that affect the individual and the way in which they carry out their life. So would you say under characteristics, whether a person is mediumistic or not? Yes. That's a characteristic. That's a characteristic. So you, you have a passion for animals, say. That might be a part of your personality. That might be part of your personality, your interests. You might be interested in yoga or something, yeah? Yeah. The characteristics is actually more about, uh, am I a mediumistic? Is that a gift that's open to me? Um, am yeah. I athletic? Am some I characteristics are natural yes. and some characteristics are developed yep. in a similar way to our personality can be natural and developed. So, for example, you may have a natural ability for mediumship, which you do, mm. and have had all of your life. Yeah. Um, you can also further develop your mediumship but some, someone else might have not had a natural ability in music. They might have a natural ability for music. And they, so they pick up the guitar and blah, 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 away they go and they can read music without even thinking about it. Whereas you might take longer to learn that. So different characteristics as a part of your soul. So this is all your half of the soul still we're talking, right? Um, there's the individualization, the individual... The individualization of your soul. And what happens, the instant that you uh, are conceived, your soul envelops the two bodies that are created at the point of conception and you then begin experiencing your life. So the individualization of your soul is about all of your life's experiences and perhaps we should write that even as, a, as another thing. The experiences you've had during your life some of which are traumatic in nature, like some of which are loving in nature and beautiful. Right? Now, many of these things are making up what's happening to you, you, the individual you. Now, you might wonder how this all impacts upon what's happened to you. Your ability then to experience these things is very dependent upon the experiences you've had. Now, for, for many people who are mediumistic, they finish up spending a lot more time in their out-of-body state or in their sleep state um, and they feel their sleep state is more real than their awake state. And if you think about your lucid dreams, a lot of times you actually feel more connected to yourself when you're in the dream yes. than you do when you're awake. Yeah. Right? And when you're awake, sometimes life feels a lot harder than the life feels in when you're in your dream. Mm. Yeah? And the reason why this is, is because uh, often during our childhood, we, we, particularly if we're mediumistic, which is one of our characteristics and it's one of yours, um, what happens during our childhood is when some negative things happen to us with the parents, you know, and so forth, and the different interactions and unloving projections that come to us as a child, we then step out of body and we learn to live more in one world than the other. We learn to live more in the spirit world, really, than we live on earth. So we actually then enjoy the experiences of the spirit world better than we enjoy things on earth. Mm. However, some of our experiences create our beliefs. And this happens at a very, very young age. And one of the beliefs that was created inside of you at a very young age is this 
viewpoint, which your parents actually do have as well, yeah. which is a viewpoint that there is good and there is evil yes. and there is a war between the darkness or the devil and God, if you like. <laughs> yeah. You think about your parents' emotions. That's right. They believe in the devil yes. and they believe in God. Yeah. Well, and just my dad, actually. Yeah. Mum's an atheist. Okay. <laughs> so, so there's a big belief in dad about devil, God, yes. devil, God. Yeah. And, and so there's a big issue with regard to the war between mm. the two forces of nature or for, forces on, in the universe that your father perceives. Now, would you characterise many of your injuries as being towards the male or towards the female? Towards the male. Okay. So the reason why this is the case is because the, most of you... When, we sort of, when we're young, we also have a group of... Which we should write down on the board as well. We have a group of emotional injuries that get created due to the conditions between one or both parents. Now, a lot of times, one of the parents we feel love for, or we don't feel love, or, or we don't feel love for. We, we often side with one parent. Mm. Who would you say you've sided? I sided with, with dad. Okay, yeah. so so most of your connections are about dad. You know, dad gives you validation, approval, acceptance. There's all that. There's a, so and and what's the feeling you receive mostly from your mother? Witnessing. Sorry. So witnessing. So not really being part of the action. So, so just stepping so back and witnessing. So mum's habit is to not yes. be involved but to observe. That's right. Yes? Yep. Uh, there's another thing you felt from your mother, if you think about it. There's a feeling that your mother projects probably at most women but particularly at you. Hmm. No, I can't feel it. You can't no. feel the feeling of competition that she's projected at you? She sees you as a competition for dad's love. Yes, yes, when I was a teenage, yep. teenager. You could, and this, yeah. is, this is a feeling that you've got from your mother quite a lot, is that, is that um, she see because dad loves you, like he, he's quite connected yep. with you, quite yep. invested in you, um, she sort of sees you as a competition for yes. dad loving her. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. So there's that also going on between yourself and your mother, which actually causes you to not be as attracted to your mother because of that feeling coming from her. Yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, so you've got those sets of emotions in play. Now, your dad's got this real good versus evil thing going on. Mm -hmm. You have also spe stepped out of your body quite frequently when you were young and, and, and in fact, have that same emotion, that there is good versus evil yeah. type of thing. Yeah. The, reality, the reality is very different in the spirit world. There is good and there is... Um, so God, God, there is no devil, yes. right? Which you've probably learnt through your spiritual perspective now. Yeah. But the problem is, is your dad still believes there's one. Yes. Right? Yeah. So how then do you resolve this issue of disagreement with your father when you're so emotionally invested in getting everything you want from him? Mm. The way we resolve it is by going into dreams and dreaming up the resolution to the issue. Do you, do you follow? Yeah, yeah. And this is what's happened for yourself. You're quite mediumistic, so you have very, very clar highly clarified dreams, mm -hmm. and very lucid dreams. And it's a way for you to resolve this issue of truth where you have a disagreement with your father about what is the truth of the universe. Your father sees the universe as polarity, yes. as good and evil. You see the, you're starting to see and have started to see for some time the universe is being a bit different to that. Yes. But how do you now resolve this disagreement with your father? Because you, you're very not, not very tempted to resolve it in the physical mm. because to resolve it in the physical would mean his disagreement yeah. and therefore his disapproval. Can you see? Yes. So it's easier for you to go and dream the resolution. Right. And therefore you have a lot of dreams about the good versus evil concept. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. And yeah. it's all because of these individual things that have happened to you in your life. Okay. Yeah. So are they real experiences? Um, well, in the spirit world, the reality is there are a heap of spirits who believe in the good versus evil concepts. Mm. And so when you slip into the s step into the sleep state, you will actually attract those spirits into your life, both the good ones and the evil ones yeah. who believe in the good versus evil concept. 
The spirits who are higher in nature don't believe in a good versus evil concept at all. But, but you will attract it because of this emotion you have going on with your father. Mm. And as a result, you will actually, when you go to sleep, have sometimes experiences in the spirit world where the good versus evil thing is being played out. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And as a result, um, you are also, if you think about it, many of your mediumship experiences have been good versus evil type experiences. Yeah. 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 And this is all because of this emotional... Uh, basically this emotional investment in dad's belief systems being very different to your own belief system and you're trying to resolve the issue emotionally. Mm. Yeah. So what's the best thing I can do in the 3D with dad or with myself? In the 3D, you mean yeah. in the physical? <laughs> reality. <laughs> okay, yeah. in reality, yes. <laughs> um, the best thing always is to tell the truth. Okay. Always. Yeah. But the issue you face is that you know your dad is going to be quite uh, challenged by that. Well, he really loves you. <laughs> That's the amazing thing. For well, no, he he loves. Weekend. He doesn't love me. Yeah, he loves idea. his idea of me. Yeah, which is very different than loving me. Yeah. Yeah. Because mm. if he actually listened to me, he would be quite challenged in his belief system. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So, so the reality is, he doesn't love Jesus. He loves his belief of Jesus, which. To be frank, most Christians are in the same position. Yeah. They love their belief system about Jesus ra and therefore they believe Jesus to be one thing that Jesus is not. Mm. Uh, and then when Jesus stands right in front of them, they go, you're not Jesus. Mm. And, and I've had that experience millions of times in the spirit world where a person's asked for Jesus, so G I, Jesus, have come to them and then they go, but you're not Jesus mm. because I'm not what they imagine me to be. Yeah. Yeah, And so with your dad, yes, you know that his concept of Jesus is very different to what your concept of Jesus is even. Yeah. And as a result of that, any discussion that's based upon religious lines automatically results in conflict between the two of you. May, while it not, may not be an emotional conflict, there is, a, there is definitely a belief conflict between the two and a feeling of disappointment in him because of his large beliefs about what he conceives to be the reality of the universe. Mm. Now, when you emotionally confront that in him, when, I, when you address that with him in the physical, just by telling him the truth, Dad, I'm sorry, but I don't believe in your concept. Yeah. I don't believe in your concept of Jesus. I don't believe in your concept of God. I don't believe in your concept of the universe. Dad is going to be quite challenged with that. Now, when dads get challenged, and particularly dads who have been emotionally invested in their daughters get mm. challenged by their own daughter who they're emotionally invested in, there is often a lot of emotion on dad's part. Yes. And that's what you're avoiding. Right. Yeah? Yeah. And your throat hurts a bit. My what? Your throat. Yes. That hurts a bit. Now? No, oh. like oh, generally. I, yes, yeah. Yeah. If I'm having a, a conflict with him. Yeah. 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 And this is all the, your... Uh, desire to um, to try and placate dad as much as possible right. um, but but you feel like you're not allowed to speak the truth then yeah and this is why this area gets quite like you feel almost like giving up with telling him the truth almost yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and because of that feeling the dreams it's the dreams are there reminding you you've got this conflict good versus evil thing with dad you know to resolve but but you're unwilling in the awake state to resolve. Until yeah. now. Until now. <laughs> yes, very Thank good. Thank you. No worries, my pleasure. Um, Nicole. Yeah. Um, speaking about dreams and sleep state experiences, yeah, I've yeah. had some, one experience, or a few, but one. Um, I would like you to ask, like, because I can't, it doesn't make sense to me really. So I was dreaming and. I was dreaming. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, and I was engaged in a fight with another person. You and were engaged in a fight, like a yeah, we had a physical we had, fight. Yeah, we, where we were supposed to fight, and the outcome would be one of us would die. Right. And who was the other person? Was it a woman or a male? A man. A man. Yeah. Okay. And um, well, I was. We were tra chasing each other, and there was one moment where I realized, okay, this time I'm not going to win, and I gave up, and I saw him coming towards me with a, like a white knife or whatever. And from that moment on, from the moment of giving in, accepting, like, okay, I'm not going to make it this time, I saw him coming towards me, but I didn't feel anything, and the next moment was I was the spirit. 
And uh, I was, I mean, I was like, I knew I was a spirit now. So you knew you'd died. I knew I had died. Right. But I didn't, I hadn't felt anything. Yep, yep. And then I was in a room with my mother and a couple of friends. And my mom had not died. So I could literally, I mean, I could really feel me as a spirit yeah. next to my mother, who was still alive. Mm -hmm. And I was, I remember I was trying to make myself known to her, mm -hmm. to show her that I'm there. And I was standing in front of her trying to, like push all my energy into my front that she feels like some kind of resistance or something from me. Mm -hmm. I was trying to, to, um, to, to move the keys that she had in her pocket. My hand would, would just like, go through, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went to the bathroom and I saw the, all the toothbrushes and I couldn't, I couldn't take them except for mine. Yeah. And I realized, oh yeah, of course, it's mine, so it's of my material, right? Yeah. So, and um, funnily enough, she kind of noticed that I was there and they had they were about to eat and they had laid the table and they placed all for also for me. Like a so they thought you were still alive? Well, they couldn't, she couldn't see me. She, I, wasn't, I, for her, I knew that she couldn't see me, yeah. but she kind of maybe sensed that I was there. So they set a place for you? Yeah, and I sat down and then there was another table next, like, next to it and there was a small child and it like, kind of blinked an eye towards me. So I, I understood that moment, oh, the child can see me, yeah. whereas no one else could. Yeah. And I found that quite, a, I can't, it doesn't make sense to me because it cannot be a sleep state experience really because my mom was sleeping at the time and if she would have been in the spirit world, she would have been like of the same matter. So I, it's I a dream. Know. It was all a dream, yeah. So it must be a dream, like you say, because there's no evidence that your mom was in the sleep state while, you know. Well, I mean, no, we are in Europe. She was sleeping at the same time, but yeah. I mean, like, I was a spirit and I, she couldn't see me and I felt like so it was very real. So she was in real, the physical though. where she would have been asleep. That's mm -hmm. what you're saying. Sorry? You're saying there's evidence to prove that it probably wasn't a sleep state experience, basically. Well, I don't know what it was, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, just like, this was all my dream. It felt oh, really I, I real agree. to me, and I could really feel like me being a spirit next to my mom who was not in that dream. I agree, I it was a dream. Yeah. yeah. So, so do you understand that when you go to sleep, you either have a sleep state experience yeah. or a dream? Yes. And yeah. the purpose of your dreams is... What's the purpose of oh your Oh, yeah, dreams? to show me my emotions that I'm unwilling to face during... Okay, good. Like ...awake state. So they're going to expose your emotions that you're unwilling to face in the awake state. Right. Yep, agreed. So, so the real question becomes, what did you feel? Yeah. Right. So when the, at the time when you had the, the guy coming towards you with a knife, mm. what were your feelings then? <sighs> well, that, of course... Well, a lot of fear okay. <laughs> of being killed. Okay. So, yeah. so can you see that's telling you that in your awake state you still have to deal with this fear of death you have? Yeah. Do you see? Yeah. And you went into a resigned state, didn't you? Like you just yeah. resigned yourself to dying, basically. Yeah. yeah, that's true. That was the point of the dream. In mm -hmm. other words, eventually you're going to be, you're not no, going to care either way whether yeah. you pass or survive. But, but that part of the dream, I feel, is telling you that you still yeah. have unresolved emotions in yeah. the awake state yeah. about yeah. death. Now, there are many people we've talked to who, every time I ask, put up your hand if you're afraid of death, often, uh, particularly in Australia, hardly anybody puts up their hand. Mm. And I find that very interesting because I feel from them that all of them are afraid of death still. Mm. So it's interesting that most of us deny we're mm. afraid of death. Like we have this intellectual thing going on of death is going to be okay or these are my beliefs about after death and so we impose our beliefs upon our feelings and we tell ourselves right. we don't have the feelings right. because we have the thought. Right. The reality is that most of us, even though we know here that there is a life after death, the majority yes. of, he of us here still don't feel it. Because if we felt it, we wouldn't be so afraid mm. to embrace our life. Yeah. Right? That's the reality. So that's the first part of the dream. Now, what do you think the second part might be? What's it about? You feel the emotion. You, 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 you can see them, but... Yeah, they couldn't see me. Or feel you. <laughs> How, does that sound like your mother? Uh, well, it sounds definitely like a big emotion that I have. <laughs> exactly, about your mother, doesn't yeah. it? A big emotion about... The fact that you feel that she doesn't really see you, she doesn't really notice you, she can only yeah. barely notice that you're around. Well, actually, oof, opposite. The life that we had was completely opposite. The but yeah, I but think emotionally I was like, you're not... Uh yeah, but see, what the life you had was your mum investing herself in you mm. most of her life. Mm. That doesn't mean she sees you. Mm. In fact, it means quite opposite. 
Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Many of us have had an emotion. Have, have many of us with our mothers have a connection with our mothers that our mothers believe they know us mm. and do lots of things for us, and we then feel that that's a connection. When the reality is inside mm. of us, the real emotion we feel is, mm. "Hey, my mum doesn't even know me yet. Mm. She just thinks she knows me." Right? Mm. And the reality is, the, your dream is telling you that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Never saw it like that. <laughs> Another unresolved emotion that your dreams tell you. Big, big one. <laughs> yeah, dreams yeah. are great, actually, like that, because they can tell you what you're ready to deal with right now. The fact that you're dreaming it mm. means you're ready to deal with this, mm. means that you want to deal with this, yeah. and in the sleep state it obviously means you definitely want to deal with it, mm. because most of our dreams actually come from images that we ourselves implant in our own mind okay. in order to deal with the emotion that we're un right. that is unresolved. Yeah? And the key is for us to embrace them. Dreams that we find confusing uh, are generally very important to analyse because they are usually the ones that we have quite strong uh, emotional connections mm. with that we're denying. So, yeah, very powerful tool, dreams, yeah. in terms of helping you progress. Cool. Yeah, yeah. thank you. No worries. Um, who? Oh, I haven't been monitoring. <laughs> if we go... No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Jessica. Okay. We haven't asked Jessica. You've had your hand up many times. <laughs> I have. It's been really You've hard to spit out this one. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know how I'll do. Yeah. I'm feeling really weird. No worries. Um, Far away. So I wanted to talk about bad spirits and in the waking. Yeah. Um, when I feel intense grief and that gets cloaked in anger, um, it's really, really, really extreme and all-consuming. Yeah. And I feel I actually haven't had much choice my whole life since a very young age. <laughs> than to surrender to that. Yeah. But I feel, um, I actually feel possessed by bad spirits at that time. Right. And it's very frightening. Mm. And I've, um, I actually physically harm myself. Yep. And the desire to kill myself is really, really strong. Really and strong, has, yeah. att has happened several times in my life. Yep. And I want to know how to handle this because it's obviously blocking me emotionally because I'm terrified that once I go into my emotions, this is going to happen again. Yeah. Can I? Um, it's a really good question, Jessica, actually, and it really probably needs us to spend a little time on it in the sense for you to understand what's really going on. Um, did you hear the discussion about that myself and Mary gave about the three selves? Did you ever see that? It was in it's Melbourne. On it's on the internet, I think, now, isn't it, Igor? Yeah. It's, very, it's on YouTube. Do you know Is where... No, 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 this is a different discussion. This is, um, we, we talked about the real self, which is, a, um, which is the self that God created. That's our soul, if you like. We don't see, my personally and Mary, we don't see our physical or spiritual bodies as very important in this process. This is, we're talking about your soul here. So this is your real self at the soul level. So that's the unique, beautiful... Um Creation, creation God. that God... So God created, created that real self. That's your personality, your characteristics, attributes, as we put on the previous board. Then there's what I would classify as your injured self. Your injured self, your, injured self, your parents created. Right? Mostly your parents. It's your environment, which pro predominantly your parents are a part of. The injured self is all of the emotional injuries that you caught uh, or attracted, uh, when I say attracted, your parents placed upon you, generally, throughout your entire life, or particularly through your childhood. Right? So these are um, a lot of often quite dark emotions, shame, grief, lots of different emotions like that. Then there's, then there's the facade self. That's the self you create. And you create that self so that you can avoid your injured self. So in other words, we, we, we then create a whole set of feelings about ourselves that we have so that we can avoid feeling these really dark feelings that our parents had about us. Does that make sense? Now here's you, and you're quite a mediumistic person, right? You have... So there's you. Now the secret to dealing with grief is to actually, remember the, it's the injured self grief that is the grief that heals you. So in other words, that's the grief that is going to help you heal emotionally. 
But what's happening, um, when you have an angry grief, which is the type of grief that you have in this condition, you're actually not in the injured self, but you're actually in the facade self. In other words, um, you feel enraged and hurt that you have this grief inside of you. Rather than actually feeling the grief, there's more, it's more of like a rage and hurt about the grief in being inside of you. Now the problem with this part of ourselves is that is the part of ourselves that attracts spirits. So every time that I try to stay away from a grief that is at regarding my childhood and instead allow grief about you know, something else other than that, in this case the feeling that of anger and frustration you have about that grief, right? You then can a spirit will generally attract, be attracted to you, and act out things with you. Now, one of the things you have done in order to avoid this terrible feelings about what you felt in your childhood is to attack yourself. Right? In other words, you learnt very, very young in your life that the way to get the parents' approval is to agree with them. And, and if they're attacking you, that means that you have to attack you. Do, do you follow me? And so now this has become a pattern for you of a way of avoiding this grief is to, to actually treat yourself badly instead of actually acknowledging that it, your parents treated you badly. Do you follow me? You find this very difficult, this bit here. For, for me to say your parents treated you badly, you just like, I don't want to admit that at all. I don't actually believe it's true. No, you've got to hold your microphone up though. So you can <laughs> I hear. don't believe it's true. Exactly, you don't believe it's true. But you're willing to attack yourself. Why are you willing to attack yourself? Where would this willingness have come from to attack yourself? Because um, I can access like a loathing of myself. Yes, um, you do have a loathing of yourself, I agree. Where did it come from is what I'm asking. Um, it's like I've forgotten something that major that happened and a lot of people have told me that, but I don't, I don't know what it is. Yeah. So you're loathing yourself and you're attacking yourself. That has to have come from somewhere, does it not? Yeah. Now, if it didn't come from your childhood... Now, I'm not saying that it was your parents who created it. It could be somebody else in your childhood that created it. But can you see it has to have come from your childhood? Mm -hmm. But the problem that you face is that you are used to doing this now, which is not feeling grief. It's actually attacking yourself. Now, when you attack yourself, you're going to also, in that same moment, invite a spirit to attack you. And this is why spirits overcloak you and actually physically attack you while you're in this state of, attack, of loathing yourself. They actually enhance your feelings of rage and anger towards yourself. Do you understand? That's what they're I doing. Do. It, doesn't, it doesn't feel like attacking myself. It feels like the pain is so unbearable. That's the only way I can move. I it. agree. So it's the gestures that go with the unbearable pain. Yep. If you hold the mic up a bit closer okay. so we can hear that's good. Yep. So that's it's actually the relief from the pain, isn't it? It feels like the only thing you can yeah. do to relieve the pain. Yeah. And that is, I think that's the key. Remember I was speaking to someone um, before about letting the feeling overwhelm you. You get to the point where the grief is triggered and you freak out and go, I don't want to feel this pain. I'm gonna, I'm, and that's immediately that the spirits can connect to you. It's about softening into this. It's the injured self gets triggered, but you've learnt these other strategies to st and they've been taught that that's a good thing to do through your childhood, but to attack yourself rather than just submit to the, to the grief that is there. Do you feel numb a lot, yeah. Jessica? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Why do you think you feel numb a lot? Um, I actually feel like I excarnate loads from my body. I so you just leave your body? You yeah. leave your body, yeah. yeah. Why yeah. do you think you would leave your body? Um, I experience extreme terror, like I'm being attacked. Feel it here and like inside there, and yeah. So, so you leave your body when you're afraid. Um, yeah. Yeah. Can you see that when you leave your body, 
your fear is actually going to be even worse because by leaving your body, you leave your body open to further attack from some external force like a spirit. Mm. Do you see? Yeah. We, we were talking about this um, just in the last meeting that we had. We were talking about... Um, well, a lot of us women have realised how much we leave our body. <laughs> At, but I was relaying how um, it's fear that makes me leave my body. It's not fear, it's my unwillingness to, to experience fear. my fear mm -hmm. that causes me to go away. So this is, this is everything that we need to remember about spirit influence, spirit attack, spirit overcloaking. Spirits have the most power when we refuse to feel ourselves. And so what's happening is you're almost even feeling attack from spirits, but because you don't want to surrender to the fear of it, it, it enables them more and you, you go out of body more. So that's, that's one key point. But what AJ is actually saying is, can you see that if you're in your body, you can actually feel... When I'm in my body, I can feel everyone much more... I'm much more aware of everyone you're who's present. here and what they're feeling as well. Yep. I'm present. When I'm out of body... I, I don't want to feel. I don't yeah. want to feel me. And, and as a consequence, I can't feel you very well either. So it's actually more of an unsafe place. I can end up having a conversation with someone. I'm sort of out of my body. And they could be, they could be murderous or they could be lovely. I have no idea. If I'm in my body, I can feel that. I can feel how I feel, how they feel. And so it's actually safer for me to make a choice that's going to that's gonna make me safer. Does that make sense? No. Can I Explain. illustrate? What's happening a lot is you're going when you're Even numb. In our when you're numb, you're afraid. Yeah. This is the thing you need to understand. When you're numb, you're afraid, and when you're afraid, you go out of your body. That's the w numbness is the way to deal with your fear. That's how you're used to dealing with your fear, right? Now, um, I can give a humorous example of when that happened to Mary this morning, actually. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, yep. Do you want to do that? Yeah. It was more embarrassing for me than you. I feel so embarrassed about <laughs> it. Um, so where we're staying, they, they service the apartments in the morning or any time during the day. Does, you don't know when they're going to knock. Um, and they change the towels and it's a service. It's lovely. But I have this anxiety about people coming into our space. And this morning we were getting dressed to come here. It was about 10 o'clock in the morning. And I'm in my underwear and AJ is completely naked. And the doorbell rings, and usually the doorbell rings and they come in the apartment. And we went, no, 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 don't come. Um, and we were in the bedroom, and I quickly, I thought, okay, I went out of body. Got to get clothes on. Right, get clothes on. Got to go out and tell her it's okay now to come in. But open one door, open the other door, and say, come in, and there's AJ. And I'm bent over <laughs> with my bottom in the air, completely naked. Because I didn't shut the door behind me because I was completely out of my body. <laughs> the poor lady, I don't know what she thought. She never said a word. <laughs> I wonder why. Now, but what that illustrates is as soon as you're afraid, there's this tendency to go out of body. As soon as you go out of body, now you, now you don't everything. know what's happening now. Now, when you're out of body and needing to feel an emotion, that's what attracts a spirit into, into the, your body, right? when you need to feel the emotion. So let's say the emotion you need to feel is how much you don't like yourself. Right? That's the emotion you need to feel. You'll be tempted to go out of your body. You don't want to feel that emotion. And you want to go numb to that emotion. You want to not feel it. Right? Now what will happen is a spirit will come in at that point in time and they will actually act out your emotion that you're trying to deny. So they will attack your body. So they will get you to attack your own body, for example, in that place. And you often, you often do it because you want to feel something is the feeling that you have as well, isn't it? Like, it's a distraction from the pain. Isn't it? It's a distraction from this pain. So if you cause physical pain, you can be distracted from the emotional pain. So can you see its underlying cause? Mm -hmm. You don't want to feel the emotional pain to the full extent. How much is the forgetting or the not being aware of what is the causal emotion in this or the cause of that emotion? How, how can I get You don't to need that? to worry about the causal emotion. You just need to allow yourself to feel the loathing without going out of your body and without attacking yourself. Does that make sense? In other words, you need to set a rule within yourself. I am not going to go away from this emotion and 
I am also not going to attack myself with this emotion. I am just going to feel it. But I also put to you that if you have so much self-loathing, there has to be a childhood event that has created this amount of self-loathing. And, it's, and you can't remember that event. So that tells me the event was traumatic. You can't have this amount of self-loathing without there being some kind of event that has caused it. Do you follow me? Yes. Now, I'm not saying it's your parents that caused it. There may be other people surrounding your parents that have created the event, but it had to have happened in your childhood. Right? So do you believe it's not possible to transfer um, <coughs> injuries from previous lives? Because that's been said to me before as well, that it's something from a past life. You've not had a past life. Okay. Simple as that. In fact, uh, there's only one other person other than myself and Mary in this room that's had a past life. Okay, so that simplifies matters, doesn't it? Yep. <laughs> you don't have to worry about trying to go back past to past lives to in order to find what it is. All right? There has to be something in this life. Now, you can have a spirit who is attracted to you acting out her life. life. That is definitely possible. So in other words, a spirit who likes you or is attracted to you ha might have been injured in her life while she was on earth. She's now in the spirit world and she's full of terror and fear and full of self-attack and self-hatred. But she can only be attracted to you if you have some similar emotions to her. Does that make sense? Yeah. So therefore that still tells me that something's happened in your own childhood okay. that has caused you to have this feeling about yourself. Now, as with all memories, they will remain completely out of our awareness completely locked up until we are willing to feel the emotion. Now, um, you need to have a chat with Fiona, actually. You understand why. Uh, Fiona Fiona's understands why. Fiona's the lady at the back with the glasses on If you put, yeah. if put <laughs> hand up. She's from England too, so you've got the opportunity to talk to them at home. Um, because Fiona's been through a very recent process where she has had these fears don't know why. You've had a lot of self-attack too, haven't you, Fee? Hasn't known why. And then over a period of slowly allowing these fear-based emotions and terror-based emotions that she's had, she's come to realise and then eventually came to a point of remembering the event that caused her to have so much self-loathing. Does that make sense? And my suggestion is have a chat to her, not so much about her... Um, the event. ...event, but, yeah but how she came to realise these things through processing emotion. Do you follow me? Yeah. So that you understand the same process. The, the, the key is that something has happened here for you to have so much self-loathing and then you not wanting to feel it, but rather wanting to either act it out or detune from it, causes these other events of, of self-attack. And causes a lot of the spirit attraction. And yeah. I feel you're correct in saying you are being overcloaked and there are spirits. But know that when you connect to your injured self, in, in, like in the emotion of your injured self, spirits can't actually attach to you in that place. So when so you fully feel this emotion, whatever this is, th there will be fear there, plus there will be grief there. When you fully feel it, and not the angry grief. Mm -hmm. The angry grief is not that place. The angry grief is where you... You know, where you're externalising it and blaming the universe or someone in the universe. Mm. I'm talking about just this real sobbing sort of a grief. When you're there or when you're feeling the terror in your body and you're there, you will not act out this. Whenever you feel yeah. tempted to act it out, my suggestion is to stop completely. Just stop completely and remind yourself that you've now gone away from yourself. Do you follow me? Um, because you don't want to act it out. You don't want to attack yourself further. You don't want to harm your body further. Okay. Right? And it's an act of love for yourself to never harm yourself. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And if you feel really impelled to do so, um, my suggestion in that moment, which is uh, you're, you're in a partnership or not, you, yeah. so get your partner just to hold you so you don't harm yourself until the feeling is over. Mm. Do, do you follow me? So you, you, can get, you can get your partner to hold your arms, hold your legs and just, just remind you that he loves you and just stay in that place. 
let the feeling stay there. You let the feeling stay there until the feeling goes over you and comes out of you. And then you'll, you'll go limp and relaxed then. And then talk about that. What actually happened? Why did the spirit overcloak you? That's the key thing you want to know. For me, I've had a, quite a number of those sorts of experiences of just feeling um, often relating to shame or something that I didn't want to see about myself. I would, it would come up and I would just feel like I, ha I hate myself and I have to attack myself and I have to punish myself for, have, for being this horrible and disgusting. And, and I, would, I would hit myself um, and eventually I just um, developed a strategy where if I felt that spirit influenced and overcloaked that I would just ask AJ even just to sit with me and I, like resist the... Resist what so I'd just hold Mary, yeah. hold Mary's arms, stop her from hurting herself, but just keep, keep feeling the emotion. Mm. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? And the spirit then goes away and then Mary's just feeling her own emotion. Yeah. But for me, the feeling of I hate myself, I want to punish myself, was all an avoidance of the, the real pain, you know? Sometimes we can kid ourselves, or I could kid myself, I needed to just feel how much I hated myself, when actually it was more specific, like there was a specific shame or a specific... It was usually a shame-based feeling that I, that I needed to connect to, yeah. So Mary's had a lot of shame-based feelings from her first century life that she's had to connect to and as a result at times wanted to punish herself for it and that's why the spirits kick in, you know. If you want to punish yourself for it, you're going to have a horde of spirits kick in and want to punish you as well. They, there are a lot of spirits in the spirit world just hanging around waiting to overcloak somebody in order to hurt their body because yeah. Yeah. of their own rage. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I wanted to be able to release the emotion. Like, I wanted so much to avoid the emotion that I would be happy to, like, physically harm myself. I wanted that to get the emotion out of me. That's how much I didn't want to just feel that emotion. Yeah. yeah. Does that make sense? Mm. The yeah. irony is when I submit to the emotion, it's actually much... Smoother, less painful and, and more loving to yeah, yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. Yeah. 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 That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how, what's the time? 6.35. How long do you want to go tonight? <laughs> so who's tired? Who's tired? Who wants to go home? One. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Marin. <laughs> um, you, I drive. think I'd have to put my hand up there, actually. <laughs> Um, I think if we do too long today, then you both all feel quite exhausted for tomorrow. And I feel if for those of you who are coming tomorrow, you'd probably want to have a decent rest tonight and have something to eat and whatever else too. So I think probably we should finish off there. Should we, one more question, is it? Sorry, I, I don't want to keep people who don't want to stay, but it's, this is very close related to what you said, and I, I just think it's a natural progression. Sure. Um, I have a son who's 12 years old, and yep. he was, um, I adopted him from an orphanage. Yep. Um, he's... From what, from lo location? From, uh, from Greece. From Greece, yep. He's very angry and um, very sad. And he's been working in therapy a lot, and I have tried to help, but I what don't What age was he when you adopted him? He was him? Um, five. Five, yep. And my question is now connected to this is that I feel that he does lots of things rather than feel that he's not good enough, that he was abandoned because he's a bad person, that he's an evil person. And he does lots of acting out. Um, he punishes himself by making people not like him. For example, he'll get up in the classroom and start screaming and dancing and doing sorts of things. And then he's punished. Yeah. So he said, of course, I'm a bad person and I should be punished. Mm -hmm. And... What I'm, my question is, how do I help a child who is, although 12, he's actually eight years old emotionally, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how do I help him feel his um, terror at having been abandoned? Because he was abandoned in the womb as well. He wasn't just abandoned physically. Um, he was a surrogate baby. So he knew that he wasn't wanted except for money. Yeah. So... He was abandoned many times, yeah. and in the orphanage he was abandoned, not just by his parents. And, yeah. and in many ways, I suppose, I have abandoned him too, in that I haven't been able to allow him to get in touch with what he's really angry about. 
and what he's really sad about, yeah. which is that he's bad, and he's bad, and he was to blame for being abandoned mm. himself. Can I know. make a few suggestions? Yes, for you? please. First, the first thing with children, um, and by the way, children of any age that we've been associated with, is for us as parents to reflect upon our own emotions that may prevent them from experiencing theirs. So, when you talk about him being abandoned, um, you have quite a lot of personal sadness about being abandoned. Do, do you see? Now, can you feel how unwilling you are to feel your own abandoned feelings? Can you feel how strongly you try to avoid those feelings? Yeah? Now, because you have a strong desire to avoid your own abandonment feelings, there's an automatic projection at any child around you that they also must avoid their own abandonment feelings. Do you see? So, so he's feeling from you, even though you're saying the words, feel it, he's actually feeling the opposite thing from your emotions. The feeling he's getting from your emotions is don't feel it, don't it's feel it. It's Look, terrible, it's too it's hard terrible. to feel It's too that. hard to feel because yeah. yeah. that's what you feel about your own abandonment feelings. Now, the first thing to address with any child who is being overcloaked by spirits and uh, anything like that is that we must first focus on the fact that we ourselves are denying an emotion. So, so if, if you, as the person who is primary caregiver in his life, are in denial of an abandoned feeling inside of yourself, you automatically have a projection at your environment that anybody in that environment, including any children, should also deny their abandoned emotion. Now, one of the most powerful things that means then for him to be able to feel his abandoned emotion without going out of body and without being spirit influenced is for you to have a change in how you feel your abandoned emotion. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So, so if you can focus on allowing the abandoned emotion that you feel to become present to actually allow yourself to feel it. And in particular, when he acts out these things in your company, so there are times when he doesn't do it in your company, and that's different to when he does. The times that he does it in your company, it means that he can feel that denial from you the strongest at that time. And what he does is he goes out of his body to get away from his own emotions. Spirit just overcloaks him and then he's in a totally different... He's a different person pretty much doing different things then. And, and it's pointless trying to punish him for it or to, do it, or to, even, or to even give him um, therapy on it because it's somebody else. It's not actually him anyway. It's a, it's a person who's taken over his body for a period of time because he's stepped out of it. And he steps out of it because he doesn't want to feel the emotion that he's learning to do not feel the emotion from you. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. So if you allow yourself to feel the abandoned, unwanted, unloved, uncared for emotion that you have from your childhood, that then, that then opens him up to feeling the same emotion. You'll find because it, now that he's 12, it'll take a little longer. If it was five, it would have been a lot shorter. But now that he's 12, it might take a few months to go through. But you'll find that once you open yourself to the emotions that he's shutting down, you'll find that within a few months, he will actually process them all quite naturally. Yeah. And even acknowledging the truth to him, like um, you're feeling really abandoned and it's hard for you to feel... I, I have that same feeling too and I'm, you know, if, as you're going into this process, talk to him about it. Yeah, I'm, sit him I'm on your lap and tell him how abandoned you felt. Yeah, thank you, that's yeah. really a big help. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. see what we often do as parents with our children is we are so, we're so protective of them, you know, we think that they don't understand things and we're so protective of them that, that we're not helping them understand much at all. What... what when, when we explain to them, actually, mummy have felt abandoned when she was a child. You know, this is the reason why. And I felt unloved and I felt this and I felt that. And, and I've just noticed that you feel the same things and it's okay. And mummy's going to, over the next few months, really concentrate on trying to feel that emotion. 
And, uh, and it, it, you can watch mummy do that and if you feel comfortable afterwards, then, then you can do it, you know? And, and then fully embrace that process. Mummy needs to fully embrace that process inside of herself. And how long it takes you to deal with that emotion will be how long it takes him to get to the point of openness to the emotion as well. Yep. Good day. Well, why don't we have a break, uh, a, break uh, a whole day's break, uh, until tomorrow at, uh, at 1.30. And uh, myself and Mary will be back here uh, around about then. So uh, we'd love to in, uh, have your company tomorrow if you still would like to have ours. Um, that would be wonderful. Um, are there any other things that we need to mention, Katerina, before uh, not going? No, so we're pretty much right. So uh, we'd just like to thank you for your time yep. and also thank you for your patience in listening to all these things. And we've enjoyed your company today and getting to know some of you for the first time as well. Yep. And I had, we, yeah, sorry, no, I had a jo you know, I don't know if most of you have probably seen the recent media stuff about us, but they called this gathering the Global Summit. Um, <laughs> but I had a joke with some of the group earlier in the week that we should all bring little flags to show where we're from. <laughs> but it, um, uh, yeah, it's lovely. It's the, it's the Greek salad, is that what you called it, Nico? It's the Greek salad of all of us. It's very nice to <laughs> yeah. feel you all. Yeah. No, it's, great. it's great to catch up with all of you and catch up with old friends too. It's really good too. So we look forward to your company tomorrow if you want to come along. Uh, it'll be 1.30, same venue. And uh, we're looking like what we would like to do after that is get this venue probably Wednesday night and then Saturday and Sunday night if we can. Sunday and Sunday next week as well for those Wednesday. of you. Be uh, at four again? Is should we that make it four? Yeah. 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 That way we can get home before dark. <laughs> Myself and Mary, as soon as it's dark, <laughs> yeah, we sleep with the chickens, as the saying goes yeah. here. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so uh, that's, that, that's why we try to finish off things fairly early if we can. Thank you for your time, guys, and we'll catch you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs>